Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. Oh, thank you, guys. Great. Well, as we, as we said at the beginning, we're going to be working on Psalms uh, this term. So just to kind of give a little overview today of the Psalms, uh, you know, I, just maybe some interesting facts, details that you, you didn't really know about Psalms and just, just kind of look at this, this great book. It is the longest book in the Bible. Um, it's from, they take the word Psalms from, it's transliterated from the, the Greek, and the Greek word actually means more to, to pluck a string, okay? So the Greek word actually touches on a little bit more the musical side of it. The Hebrew side of, of that word that we, we call Psalms, the Hebrew side is actually for praise. So what we see here is we see poems of praise meant to be sung meant to be put to music. So this is the songbook of the early church. These are the songs that have been passed down. But it's more than just songs. It's more than just songs because these are divinely inspired. These are in God's word and, and God moved through these speakers, or through these writers, through these singers, through these words, God moved to create, um, to, to create songs of his word. Now, Approximately one-fourth of the Old Testament is poetry. And I say that word poetry, and as an English teacher, I know there's groans, right? Ah, oh, poetry. But God used one-fourth of the Old Testament. He used this form called poetry. Um, you know, the, and, and a lot of it was sung. It was, put into, it was put into songs. So if we understand poetry better, we actually uh, will understand the Psalms better. We can understand how to, to read and understand God's word as we go along. So when you think of the difference between poetry and prose, one of the things that poetry seeks to do is to get more at the emotions, to get more at the heart, right? A lot of times when we sing these songs and we, and we sing these beautiful words, it really gets to our heart a little bit more maybe than, than the sermon. Uh, we can feel close to God sometimes a little bit more through a song than, than maybe we do reading his word, okay? So that's, that's, not, that's not like by accident. And God's not mad about that. He uses this poetry. He uses song to bring our emotions, to bring our creativity into his word and what he wants to tell us. Now, there's five kinds of, of psalms. Uh, the two biggest ones are praises and laments. Praises and laments. So laments are the things that make you sad, right? It's, it's crying out. It's being, uh, it's being uh, you know, just, just sad, confessing your sadness to God. 57 of the Psalms, 57 of the 150 Psalms are laments. So that tells me that God cares a lot about our pain. He cares a lot about our feelings. He cares a lot about our sadness. He cares about our hearts a lot because he, he wanted those songs to be there to express how we feel and then how he comes and blesses us. And when the Bible talks about praise, um, it might seem obvious, but when the Bible talks about praise, it's actually not just talking about something you can do inside your head. It actually, the word means out loud. It means to shout it. It means to sing it. It means to exclaim it. So there's this idea of it being vocal. Now, you can thank God in your heart, right? You can, you can pray silently, but when we talk about the Psalms and we talk about the praise, it's this loud, um, out, outward expression. And it's also meant to be public. Again, we can praise God in private, but in the Psalms, we see this element of we're supposed to do this together. We're supposed to let each other know. We're supposed to praise him and say, do you see what I see? You know, do you see him? Look at this. He's amazing. What has he done? And so there's also this element of praise. The oldest Psalm was written by Moses, the 15th century B.C., it's so about 3,500 years ago. Isn't that amazing? Passed down to us. The youngest psalm in the Bible was from about the 5th century, right after the exile, after they come back into the, the promised land after the exile. Um, David wrote about half the psalms. There's a lot of other psalmists, though. Some we don't really know who wrote them. But some of the psalms were actually written by non-Hebrews, 
They were written by, by pagans. But they weren't just pagans. They were pagans who had learned to worship the true God, the God of Israel, Yahweh. So God always has had a heart for the nations, right? Like we prayed for the UPGs. That's always been part of his heart, reaching out to the nations. And he did that in Old Testament times as well. And people praised him because of, uh, because of his revelation to them. Now, like we said, they were music in their day. And uh, the Levites were the professional musicians, okay? They were the, pr- the priests, but they were also professional musicians who would lift up these psalms into song, okay? So that's a little bit about those. And then what, what did they use? And maybe you've, you've read in your psalms before. At the beginning, it kind of talks about all these weird instruments. Um, and, we're, you know, a lot of them are like, we don't even know what that is. We don't use those anymore. I've never seen one of those. Um, some of them are very, very rare. But all of the instruments that were used to turn the psalms into the music by the Levites, all of those instruments were actually pagan instruments. There was no instrument that was invented by the Hebrews. Isn't that interesting? God used these instruments from other cultures, cultures that weren't worshiping, weren't loving him, and he used these instruments and he says, I'm going to take that thing, that thing that's used for evil, and I'm going to turn it, I'm going to turn it for good. And so he used those instruments. And so I know some of you maybe are thinking of like churches that you can think of. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but a lot of churches are like, you can't have a guitar in church. You can't have drums in church. A um, hundred years ago, people said, you can't have a piano in church. They said, you can't have an organ in church. That's, that's not, you know, like, uh, that's, that's actually part of our history of church because people associated that with evil and sin. But the reality is it's the heart of worship that God wants. So not just about the instrument. Even the Hebrews didn't have any of their own instruments. Um, Because they were their psalms, just like you guys have a lot of songs memorized, right? Maybe if you don't have the whole song memorized, you have a chorus of it memorized or a verse of it memorized maybe. Well, they had their psalms memorized, the Hebrews. And so when, when, uh, when the Jews started seeing it and the Hebrews started seeing Um, Jesus come, they actually were kind of like, whoa, that in Jesus' life reminds us of this from the Psalms. Did you know that 64 of the 150 Psalms are actually quoted in the New Testament? There's 79 verses, at least, that were quoted in the New Testament from those 64 Psalms. And some say there's maybe even 300 or more allusions to the Psalms. Now, an allusion, I know know my high school English students know this, but an allusion is when you refer to something, you don't say it directly, but it's kind of that's what you're thinking of, right? You're thinking of that image, you're thinking of that idea. And so they think maybe even up to 300 allusions where they didn't actually say the Psalm, they didn't actually say the verse but they, you know they were thinking that. So that, if you total that up, that's 400 times in the New Testament we have allusion, we have a, a reference from the Psalms. Psalms is such an important book. It's such a gift to us. Jesus quoted the Psalms 11 times, and there was at least 68, maybe as many as 92 prophecies given to us about who the Christ would be. So when, again, as they, just imagine as they're like, Jesus is doing these things, right? These things are happening in Jesus' life. And I can imagine the apostles and the early church just being amazed that they saw the fulfillment of these 1,500-year-old psalms coming to fruition in their day. What a joy. What a joy that must have been for them. So today, we're going to look at Psalm 51. I didn't get the clicker, but there's really not many slides, so okay, I'll take it. Cool. Um, We're going to look at Psalm 51, which you already read. Thank you so much. We, um, we already read that, and our, our, our main idea, okay, I put in one sentence, and I'll, I'll say it a few times, but the main idea of this psalm, this is the song of the forgiven, the song of the forgiven, and the main idea of this song written by David is that God floods us with joy when we confess, cry for mercy, and are cleansed. God floods us with joy when we confess, cry for mercy, and are cleansed. This is an interesting psalm because we don't have many that are this, well, yeah, this, this 
interesting that there's a connection between this psalm and another part of the Old Testament. This is the psalm that David wrote right after his experience of having an affair with Bathsheba, killing Bathsheba's husband, covering it up, and Nathan the prophet coming and telling him, you did wrong. This is wrong. You need to repent, king, for what you've done. Okay? This is his, this is what he wrote. So we have not only the history of it, right? We have the narrative, the story of it, but then we have this very personal reaction. We get to see the inside feelings and thoughts, and God inspired David to, to pen Psalm 51. I guess he didn't pen it. I guess he didn't have pens, but you know what I mean. So the first thing we're going to look at is actually verses 3 through 6. And if you don't know that story, again, 2 Samuel 11 to 12, you'll have to read it later. Um, verses 3 to 6. For I know my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. So you hear, you hear here how David says, my sin was always before me. Do you feel the anguish that David has? Do you feel the, the pain in his heart because of, of what he's done and, and, and his conviction over his sin? There's many people in society today that says you shouldn't feel bad. You should never feel bad. You should never feel sadness. You should never feel guilt or shame. They say these things are bad. Well, here it seems like David's feeling pretty bad. And it seems like that's actually appropriate. It seems like here, that's actually a good thing. It's actually what he needs to feel when he sinned. And I understand why society, why non-Christians would say that we should never feel bad. Because they don't know forgiveness. They don't know what to do with it. It just feels bad. I don't know what to do with this. I feel terrible. I know I make mistakes. But what else am I supposed to do with it? So let me just not feel it. And so they go to counselors and they go to psychologists and they go to psychiatrists and all that stuff and they say, I feel bad. And the psychiatrist, you know, again, non-Christian psychiatrist would say, don't feel bad. You're good. Everything's okay. Right? They don't know, they don't have anything to do with it. But we as Christians know there's, there's forgiveness. It's, God wants us to feel that, that pain when we've sinned. Okay? I'm going to say this and... The, this statement is that feeling the fullness of guilt and shame is needed. We need that. Because if you don't know that, then you don't know how great God's forgiveness is. You don't know how amazing his mercy is unless you realize how low um, and how, how wrong what you've done actually is. Now, we're not talking about wallowing in guilt, okay? We're not talking about... Uh, I'm terrible, I never can do anything right, because then you don't really know forgiveness. If you're wallowing in guilt, you're feeling terrible, you don't really know forgiveness if that's where you're living. There's a great quote by a Scottish pastor, Robert Murray McShane. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. We have to look at ourselves, guys. We have to realize, like David did, I messed up. I have, and, and it's not just the sinfulness for David of like, I did this thing. Like, oh, that one thing I did, things A, B, and C, those things I did, those were bad. But do you see how he says I was sinful from birth? He realizes, you know, not the, you know, theologically we are sinful from birth, but he actually feels that this is within my bones. I can't get rid of this. It's so deep. It's so deep. But... We don't just take, we don't just look at ourselves. We take one look at ourselves and we took ten, we take ten looks at Christ. His mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, that's what we need to come back to. That's what we need to marvel in. Again, not walking around, I'm so messed up, I've failed so bad, I feel so bad, all those things. But God, you are the forgiver of my sins. God, you are the good one. Now, verse 4 says something interesting. Against you, you only have I sinned. Okay? 
Joseph says something similar to this. Do you remember the, the story when Joseph's working for Potiphar and Potiphar's wife is trying to get him to sin with her? And she's, she's married to Potiphar, but she's wanting to be with David. And David says, how could I do this wicked thing and sin against God? And we read that sometimes and we're like, whoa. Like, you're just, you know it's the wrong thing to do. You're not supposed to do that thing with Potiphar's wife. But he says, I'm not supposed to sin against God. He has in mind directly God. God is in his vision all the time. And it's the same idea here. David has God in his vision. When he's told that he sinned, when he realizes his sin, the first thing he says is, it's God that I've sinned against. Are you like that? Am I like that? When we mess up, when we get angry, when we say something we shouldn't say, is God in our view? Or is it, oh no, now that person's going to be mad at me. Oh, now I got to go apologize to that person. Oh, you know, is it, is it focused on me? Is it focused on even the other person? The bigger sense is that you're focused on God. So he's really not saying it's only you. He's saying it for emphasis, right? In the poem, he's saying it for emphasis. Compared to my sin against you, Bathsheba, you, Uriah, who's now dead, you, nation of Israel, compared to what I've done to God, all of that is nothing. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that sense of guilt he has that those awful things that he's done are seen as nothing compared to the sin that he committed against God? There's a, there's a verse in the New Testament that's kind of strange. I don't know if you guys have ever thought it was strange before, but Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 15, he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Did you guys ever hear that before? And when you heard that, what was your reaction? I think mine was like, Paul, you know, you're exaggerating. You realize you're not the worst sinner, you know. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of non-Christians, you know, there's a lot of people who murder in jail. There's a lot of people worse than you, Paul. Um, and maybe even you, like me, sometimes think, I am way worse than Paul. <laughs> Paul, you're not the worst of sinners. You're not the chief of sinners. I am. How could you say something like that, Paul? But it's this idea that he is realizing how dreadful he is. He's realizing how wicked he is, and he's getting a taste of how great God's forgiveness is. Just like David saying, I'm only sinning against you, God. He's saying, I'm the chief of sinners, and I've felt God's grace in my life. And he says that later in, in verse 16, right after that. He says, I've felt God's grace in my life, which makes the depths of my sin even, even you know, more amazing. Because God reaches all the way down, and God fills me with grace. God fills me with forgiveness over and over again. Got another great quote, another Scottish pastor. Man, these, these Scottish, they're just, just tearing it up this morning. Alexander McLaren, he said... The sign of growing perfection is the growing consciousness of imperfection. The sign of growing perfection is the consciousness or awareness of imperfection. So actually, as you learn more about God, it makes you realize how low you are. It makes that gap bigger and bigger between God and you. And he says that the more you become like Christ, the more you will find out your unlikeness to him. So it's not getting more perfect. It's not getting to know God more makes me more perfect. It makes, it makes me realize how imperfect I am, but how amazing his love is, how amazing his mercy and grace are to me. C.S. Lewis said, when a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness 
less and less. Right? So people who say, oh, I'm okay, I'm not that bad, I'm not as bad as that guy over here, I'm not as bad as that person over here, they're actually understanding themselves less and less and definitely not understanding God. They're not growing in perfection. If they're quick to point out people who are worse than them, people who are beneath them, right? You know, if you have the thought, I'm one of the better Christians in grade four. I'm one of the better Christians in grade nine at RVA. I'm one of the better Christians at Kajabi Hospital. I'm one of the better Christians in the English department. If you have that thought, then there's a really good chance that you're not growing closer to Christ because you're not growing in humility. So all of our sin is done to God first. Feeling sorry is a good thing as you get more aware of how holy God is. Okay. So, whoops, not quite ready for that yet. Let me go back a slide. Okay, verses 1 and 2 and then 7 and 9. And you're going to see lots of similarities between these verses. Have mercy on me. So we'll do 1 and 2 and then we'll do 7 and 9. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. So there again, the deep cleaning that needs to happen, right? He's crying out for mercy because the deep cleaning that needs to happen. Now, there's some really powerful verbs here, okay? There's some action words, and they're not just powerful verbs. Well, they are powerful, powerful verbs because they are so pictorial. They really give us a powerful image. And so um, the words you may have heard repeated, right? In both of these verses, these kind of like two chunks that we just read, we saw the same three words repeated twice, did you pick up on that? Do you see the words that are repeated? Blot out, wash, and cleanse. Okay, so you see how, 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 how needful, how needy David is in this moment that he feels this, you know, my sin, I, I need to get rid of it, God. It's crushing me. It hurts so much. I wish it could go away. Blot it out, wash it, cleanse it. Well, this is, this is the idea of blotting out. I don't know if you guys have ever seen documents like this before, but sometimes documents like this are used in, in legal cases or in politics. And the reason they do this is because there's certain ideas maybe they want to protect or information, or maybe it's names that they want to leave out of that, that political idea or something like that. So this is called redaction. This is the idea of blotting out. You, I promise, cannot see through that. You have, you have no way of figuring out, once that copy is made, it has been blotted out entirely. Okay, it's been completely removed. Now, if I took a pen and I crossed something out, I'm sure you've all done that, right? You can still kind of see it, right? You cross it out, you can still see it. It's still there. But when you blot something out, it's been completely removed. Like, like a word from a book or a word from a document. Uh, you guys know the upper rock over on, or the field? Yeah, da, 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 da. the rock on upper field. You guys know that, that rock over there and how it gets painted all the time? You guys know what that looked like in 2008? You guys know what it looked like 2012? 2015? No, you don't. Why? Because it's been covered. It's been covered by layer after layer of paint. It's been blotted out. There's no way to know without a picture what was on that rock years ago. It's been blotted out, and your sins will be, can be blotted out by God as well. That's the truth of the gospel, that freedom to have your sins completely removed. Okay? I don't know. You know, teaching isn't really that dangerous overall. There's no sound to this video, by the way. Um, teaching isn't that dangerous overall um, you know, sometimes I've gotten paper cuts, you know, cramps, you know, you're standing all day. But really, it's not that dangerous at all. But, but there are some things that are scary about teaching. And that is when you accidentally take a permanent marker to your dry erase board. Okay? When you take a permanent marker to your dry erase board, 
It's permanent, right? The word is permanent, and it's scary, and you wipe it, and you get your cleaning solution, and you get your finger, and all you do is smear it. The harder you scrub, it, it doesn't come out. It doesn't come out. But Jesus is like a tri erase marker. I'm sure you've never heard that before. <laughs> Jesus covers over our sin with his perfect blood. He covers us, guys. Those permanent sins that cannot be removed any other way can be removed by the perfect blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So as you can see, the permanent sins, your permanent sins, the things you've done, when you ask Jesus for forgiveness, can be completely wiped away. That's the idea of cleansing, guys. The permanence is gone. That's the idea that he's talking about here. And he trusts in God. He knows that God can do this. So how do we feel? How do we feel when that's our reality? How do we feel when the worst thing you've done has been wiped away, has been cleansed, has been covered by the blood of Jesus? You feel joy. Let's read 10 to 15 together. Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways that's so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God my Savior and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. The first word there in verse 10, create in me a clean heart. That word is the same word that's used in Genesis 1. Who created in Genesis 1? God. God created. He created as only he could create. He can create out of nothing. And he can create out of your life the deadness, the dirtiness, the, the, the pain of your life, he can create something new by the blood of Christ. He can create a clean heart, a pure heart. What joy. What joy is there for us. How that joy floods us. Now verse 11, sometimes people get a little scared with verse 11. Because David says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. And I don't know if you've ever thought that, but maybe you've done something bad or you've had a thought that you're ashamed of and you've said, God, God's going to take the Holy Spirit from me. God's, that's finally it. God's had enough with me. I'm done. God cannot take the Holy Spirit. That was the Old Testament you know that after Jesus was resurrected, that's when the Holy Spirit came into the lives of believers. Everything changed at that point. So the Holy Spirit is with you forever. And if you're wondering theologically, you wanna, you're doubting that at all, I'm going to give you two verses you need to go look up. John 14, 16. Okay? John 14, 16 and Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. It's not theologically possible. The Holy Spirit... Once in you, it's not possible for that to be removed. You're safe, Christians. You're safe in God's love with the Holy Spirit. But here's what I think David was really expecting. What it felt like, I think he's getting at. What it feels like when we, we don't have the joy from God. When we don't have the joy of the Holy Spirit. And he just begs, God, I want to be in your presence I in again. Presence again. I've known the pain of what it's like to be away from your presence, and I want to be in your presence again, and I want your Holy Spirit to fill me again. God, that's what I need. So that was his prayer. You can't have both sin and the joy of your salvation. Okay? There may be sin in saved people in their lives, right? As, as Christians, we, we will sin. But the joy of your salvation, you, you trade it in. You can only have one at a time. 
You can't have the joy of your salvation and the pleasures of sin. You can only have one or the other. David traded that in and he realized it. And it felt good. Okay? If you guys haven't figured it out by now, sin feels pretty good to the flesh. But it kills our souls and it steals the joy, it steals the blessing of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't leave us as Christians, but we do grieve it. This is a, the sounds. Do you guys notice all the, the actions David talks about after that happens? After he realizes God's forgiveness, did you notice all the actions? Let's, let's just hit some of them again. It says, I will teach transgressors your ways. My tongue will sing of your righteousness. My mouth will declare your praise when God's forgiveness has, has gotten to our deepest core, when we know how loved we are, when we know how forgiven we are. It comes out of us. It comes out of us in words. It comes out of us in the way we, the way we live our lives. It comes out of us in, in the way we spend our time. God's salvation brings about a reaction of joy. And that's the words given here. This joy of the salvation will over, overflow. It will flood out of David when this happens. Our last two verses that we're going to look at. Sorry, I lopped off 18 and 19 for the sake of time. But they're there as well. 16 and 17. He gives. He gives. And we humbly receive. Verses 16 and 17. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. When David says that he doesn't have a sacrifice that he can give for this sin, he's actually speaking completely literally. In the Old Testament, there's a lot of laws. You guys, have, you guys have heard about the rules and the laws and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of laws in the Old Testament. Okay, go look at the book of Leviticus, okay? Isn't that when people try to, I don't know if any of you made your New Year's resolution, I'm going to read the Bible, and, you know, people do pretty well until they hit Leviticus. And then it's like, oh. okay, there's so many rules, so many regulations, but in all those rules, there is no sacrifice for adultery and murder the way David committed them. Could you imagine how that must have made David feel? He lived in a society where by faith, they gave sacrifices. By faith in God, they said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. God, please forgive me. But there was nothing for him. He had sins that there was nothing to forgive. But who does David look to? Okay. And who do we look to? And we realize Again, that the Old Testament system of sacrifice was there for a time. It was there for them to put their faith in and say, God, you will forgive. You are just, God. And we know that blood is the necessary sacrifice for our sins. So what's David to do? What are we to do, guys? There's no sacrifice for our sins. There's nothing we can do, as we talked about last term in Galatians. There's nothing we can do. Try harder. Stay up later. Pray more. Whatever. There's no sacrifice. There's no sacrifice we can give. Um, this, I was going to ask before the service. Does anybody know? This isn't actually hyssop, is it? Does anybody know? This is like something that grows around here a lot. I just got it. Maybe not. I don't think it's hyssop, okay? When I looked at a picture of it, I was like, whoa, we have that. That's hyssop. But I don't think it actually is. It looks a little bit different. Like, hyssop's a little, like, greener down here in the stalk. And anyway, but it looks, like, really, so it's a visual aid, okay? Pretend this is hyssop. It's super close. It's like this really bushy plant, okay? And let's go back to verse 7 quickly as we, as we wrap this up. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. That's a direct reference to Exodus 12, 22. Exodus 12, 22. Okay? The, the hyssop is what they would use because it was so like, like a, it's almost like a natural paintbrush, right? It's, um, 
it's so, yeah, it's so bushy and thick. And so what they would do is they'd take the blood of the lamb with the hyssop and they would put it over the door frame of their houses. And that's how God's wrath would pass over them. Once they were covered with the blood of the lamb, God's wrath would pass over them. And you guys know what the Passover means. You know how it was a type in the Old Testament of the perfect sacrifice of the lamb. So David says, there's no sacrifice I can do. There's no sacrifice I can give. But God, if you cleanse me with hyssop, if you give me the perfect blood of your son Jesus, I will be clean. I'll be washed whiter than snow. And that doesn't make sense because blood's red. <laughs> right? We all know that. You don't wash something in red and it becomes white. But we do with Jesus. When we're washed with him, when it's his sacrifice that we put our faith in, we are washed whiter than snow. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. When you've been cleansed with hyssop, when you've been cleansed by the perfect blood of the Lamb, the holy God who is so far above us in our sinfulness has made you in his eyes righteous. He has cleansed you entirely. He has purified you from all sin. You are now the righteousness of God. You are cleansed. You are whole. Our reaction then, verse 17, is a broken spirit. is a sad, sorry heart because we realize what God has done for us. How much it cost him for our sin. And we overflow with joy. Like, wait, doesn't it say broken and contrite heart? Why are you telling me I need to have joy? How can I have joy if I have a broken and contrite heart? Because if you're a Christian, you hold both at the same time. You realize how broken you are. You realize how needy you are. And you cling to the love and forgiveness of God and the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. And that fills you with joy. If you, if you ignore your sin, if you stop, if you say, I don't have sin, if you, if you like never really say, I'm sorry, God, for anything, and you never say sorry to anybody else that you've done anything, and you walk around like you're perfect, okay, you let go of the other two. You really don't understand God. You really don't understand his perfect sacrifice and how, how much joy is there. You're walking on your own. You're doing it on your own. But when we have a broken and contrite heart, when we're full of repentance, that's the only heart a Christian can have. And that's when God fills us up with his joy. That's the blessing that he gives us. God floods us with joy when we confess, cry for mercy, and are cleansed. So confess today. Confess tonight. Confess. Let your heart be broken by what you've done. Ask God to show you Cry for mercy. Cry for that mercy that you don't deserve. Beg him for it. And then rejoice because he answers. Rejoice because he's given you the perfect sacrifice, the forgiveness that Jesus provided on the cross. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, as we sang earlier, the Father's wrath completely satisfied Jesus, thank you. Your blood has taken away my sin. Jesus, thank you. And Lord, I know right now you are, you're calling some people. You're calling some people out of the darkness. They've been, they've been sad about their sins. They've been frustrated about their sins. They've been living in pain, God. And you're calling them out of that darkness into your love and your light and you're wanting them to come running into your arms. And Lord, there's some right now who think they're all right, and they think they're okay, and they think they're, they're doing pretty well. And Lord, you're calling them to see how broken they are, see how much they need you, 
and how they're not doing okay. And God, I just pray that your spirit would work in our hearts, work on our campus, God. We're thankful for what you're doing. We know you're moving, Lord. We've seen you move, and we ask for more of it, God. Move, Father. Move. Cleanse us. Make us white as snow, God. Flood us with joy with the reality of your salvation. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. be dismissed here in a second. If you need to stay and pray, we're going to play some music and you just stay in your seat. If you want to come up front, if you want to find a staff member to talk to or a friend to talk to, please do that and um, rejoice in the forgiveness that's been given to you. Rejoice in the perfect sacrifice of the Son. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we've worshipped you. We've heard of uh, David's story today and Lord, we, we know that that's the perfect path of sadness, sorrow, 
to rejoicing and praise for what you've done. We pray, we thank you, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.